Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for making it along this afternoon. Um, I'd love to say it's lovely to see you all, but I can't, I can't see everybody apart from the little number that's, that's creeping up at the side. But thank you for, for making the time to join us. Um, I'd imagine that most of you have been at the, the previous session that we had, so you'll be familiar with, with Sarah. Um, and I'll hand over to, to Sarah shortly. Um, I suppose the first thing I wanted to do was to thank you for the efforts that you've gone to to support the, the cohort of probationers this year. Um, it's certainly not getting any easier, is it, this year? It's not something that was just a bit unsettled to begin with. And, and we realise the, the demands that that's, that's made on your time and the effort that, that you've gone to, to to really make the, the probationers get the best from this year. So thank you very much for, for doing that. Um, the purpose of, of this afternoon was to share with you the, the feedback, I suppose, what the main themes have been that have come from the first phase of support that, that we've put in, in place. Um, the videos, the, the rubric, and then um, primarily the, um, the coaching conversations that, that Sarah has led. And then I think because of the success of those, we are looking at how we can continue to support this cohort that, that were kind of highlighted to us at the beginning of the session and we'd really value your your thoughts around that there's obviously some key things that, that Sarah will share with you and um, some key messages that come from the first phase um, and our idea would be that we would offer a second phase of support to those probationers who are still not satisfactory so anyone who had um, an interim profile submitted with a recommendation of cause for concern or unsatisfactory. Um, it, according to our records, there are 65 probationers in, in that boat who engaged in the coaching conversations. So that's been a dramatic drop, which we're absolutely delighted with. So we're on, we're on the right path, but we'd like to continue to support that group. So we're interested to know um, what you think the most effective way that that would be um, in, in providing the support. And just having a conversation before, so because it's, it's a webinar, it really, we're dependent on you typing things in, if you can, to, to the chat at the side and, and the questions. And, and Kirsty is going to manage that side of things for us um, to be able to feed back to us and we can take all of that on board. So I'm going to hand over to, to Sarah just now, who will talk us through um, the first phase of the package that, that was put in place, Sarah. Thanks, Elaine. Um, yeah, as Elaine said, I had, I think it's 167 uh, coaching conversations in the end with, with MQTs, which was, um, I guess, a real privilege in many ways, because I got an insight into their experiences um, across Scotland. I had the chance to chat to them about how they were getting on and how they were finding things. And um, I have to say the, the 167 that turned up very much turned up um, wanting to wanting to improve, wanting to do what they needed to do to to get um, get to where they needed to be. And of course, that was different for for all of them. And there was all sorts of different things coming up for each of them. But they absolutely showed up to those sessions with um, a real commitment. I think actually, which is important to recognise because it's not it's not an easy time to be an NQT. Um, it's probably not an easy time to be a supporter either and that we recognise the demands that are going on in schools or were going on in schools and are continuing to go on in schools and outside of schools as well at the moment too. Um, and I think that's something else actually that so many of them recognised was that the situation in schools is not always easy and it was particularly not necessarily easy um, with COVID restrictions and, and there was a sense of many of them not really wanting to be be a bother or be a burden. Um, and I do think that in some cases that probably got in the way of them seeking the help or seeking the advice that they also needed at that time. So what I wanted to do today was just to share with you um, one of the themes that kind of kept coming up was around feedback and NQTs feeling kind of overwhelmed by the feedback that they were experiencing. And I reflected on this during the sessions, I reflected on it afterwards and what I want to do today is to kind of share my story of that, how I've kind of made sense of it I suppose and the different 
parts of the puzzle that I've put together to make sense of that. I'm by no means suggesting that it's um, it's the reality <laughs> um, or that it's everybody's experience, but I think it's it's an attempt to try and convey my experience, which was obviously quite unique because I spoke to 167 of them. Um, and so it's a way of kind of sharing that with you as, as best I possibly can. Um, so if Kirsty, if you could share the sketch note, that would be great. Um, and then everybody will be able to see it. Perfect. Um, apologies for the quality of my uh, drawing skills. I'm not, I don't profess to be <laughs> a brilliant artist, but it is, I find sketch notes quite a, a useful way of pulling information um, together and kind of yeah, finding the connections and joining the dots between the experiences I had and also what I know from kind of research and writing around feedback, both within the context of, of education and kind of feedback more broadly as well. And I, I think the um, you can download this from the from the chat as well. If not, then we'll, we'll find a way to, to make it available to you. So I'm going to start in that top. Uh, left hand corner with the tsunami of feedback because that was one of the things that um, came from a number of of the NQTs feeling like they were experiencing a tsunami of feedback um, and I guess within that there was also a recognition of the place of feedback in their NQT year and the importance of it but at the same time that it still felt like um, a, a tsunami. It felt like there was a constant uh, wave of feedback or a constant flow of feedback for them. And I guess some of the questions that came up for NQTs was, you know, what is the feedback? What is it I need to do? How do I do it? When do I do it? What do I need to do first? Um, and then also sometimes a sense of, I thought I had done that but then getting feedback that suggests they hadn't done it. And so sometimes being a little bit stuck in this, almost like in a loop of not quite knowing how to interact with the feedback and how to get the most from the feedback. Um, and that for me raised questions around the, the clarity, um, the clarity of purpose, I suppose, around feedback. And it, it made me think about, you know, what is the purpose of feedback? And, Feedback um, is probably one of the great enigmas of education. We've talked about feedback for years, but we still we still keep talking about it. There's still lots of struggles around feedback and getting feedback right. And maybe it's just one of those things that that will continue to evolve and continue to develop. And so we'll never quite be there and have it sorted. But when it when I was thinking about that clarity of purpose, I came back to the purpose of feedback being to close the gap. It's about closing the gap between where we are and where we need to be. And actually, do we have that shared understanding um, or that shared definition of what feedback is that helps us to understand when we have received it? Because we know that giving is not the same as receiving. I think it was um, Dylan William that, that said that, that we can give lots of feedback, but it doesn't necessarily mean, and this was in the context of the classroom, doesn't necessarily mean that our children have received it. And I think it's very, it can be very much the same when we're thinking about feedback between adults as well. Just because we've given it doesn't necessarily mean that it has been received. And if it's not being received or if the re receiving is, is patchy or faulty, that will then impact on the implementation of that feedback. So in addition to, to kind of closing the gap as being the purpose of feedback, it's also about learning and it's about growth. And I think that creates a tension because what I was hearing and what I was seeing from, from some of the NQTs was that they absolutely want to learn and grow and they recognize that they are at the beginning of a journey. They are far from, you know, far from the end of that journey, they're very much at the beginning and they're open to learning and growing, but at the same time, they really want to be, um, they want to be accepted and they want to be respected and they they don't want to let people down. And that that kind of was creating a tension that want to learning, wanting to learn and grow, but also wanting to be respected and accepted and to, and to do well. And that tension can sometimes impact on, 
how they engage with feedback and their ability to to hear and to receive the feedback as well. And I think, you know, if if we're all honest, that's probably a tension we can all recognise from um, from experience as well. So. A question for me is around shared clarity. Do we have shared clarity of what feedback looks like um, in the NQT year? And I was drawn to the work of, um, and it, the, the references are down the side, the uh, Thanks for the Feedback book. They explore um, three types of feedback. So the first one being around um, appreciation. So when we get thanked for the work we do, we get thanked for the contribution that we that we make. And I suppose the sense that I got was sometimes that all, isn't always necessarily present um, in the experience of the NQTs that I was that I was talking to. Um, and I wonder if sometimes that just gets confused. The types of feedback get confused in the NQT year because there is an awareness, and that was certainly coming through from the NQTs I was speaking to, there's an awareness that the year is about evaluation. And so if the focus is on evaluation, that the third one on that list, you know, here's where you stand, where, where do the appreciation and the coaching elements of feedback or types of feedback sit? And do we have an emphasis or a tendency to emphasize or to fall into the evaluation on an ongoing basis? And perhaps are we giving enough appreciation type feedback? Are we giving enough coaching type feedback as well? And sometimes I wonder if the experience of the coaching type feedback, so here's a, and they, this is the way they define it in their book, um, the, the Thanks for the Feedback book is that the coaching type feedback is, you know, here's a better way to do this. But I, I got a sense that sometimes that was either um, delivered as or experienced as, and of course, I don't know exactly which one of those it was, instead of it being, here's a better way, here's my way. And so thinking about the language that we use and the purpose of that feedback, how do those three things align? So if the purpose of feedback is to close the gap between where we are and where we need to be, how do we use effectively those three types of feedback? How do we use appreciation to build the sense of self, sense of um, self-efficacy? How do we use coaching to nudge people forwards to where we want them to be? And how do we use evaluation that gives them clarity on where they stand in relation to the standards, in relation to where they should be um, at a certain point in time? And sometimes NQTs were coming to the sessions not being clear where they stood. So particularly um, just at that point where the where the profiles were due in, just in, in December there, there were still some NQTs coming at, at that point who, who didn't seem to be clear where they were in relation to where they should be or, or the profile at that point in time. And all of those types of feedback are needed, but the key is it's the right time and the right place. So it's thinking about which ones do you need to give when, who needs them at different points, and also this idea of the match. So it's about knowing what you want. So as the person receiving the feedback, what is it you want? What, what do you feel you need at a certain point in time? But And also knowing what you're getting. So being clear that within the conversation or within the session, within the, the supporter session or within, within a particular meeting, that you know what kind of feedback you're going in to get. So are you at a stage where it is going to be about that evaluation type conversation? So when you go in, you know that's what you're going into. And sometimes that, that can help knowing what you're going to get in loose terms, um, in terms of the type of feedback, can help to reduce some of the barriers to engaging with that feedback. Um, but in addition to reducing the barriers, it can also help you be open to engaging with the feedback as well, because the match is right and you're in the right kind of mindset, I suppose, or headspace to be able to engage with that kind of feedback. And so I want to pick up then on the three um, triggers. They're kind of in the middle of my beautiful sketch note. Um, the three triggers, 
that block feedback. So the first one is, is truth. And that's where sometimes the feedback we receive feels off. It just doesn't feel helpful. It doesn't feel true. And that can be, there's a lot of perception, as you can see, tied up in that. The relationship element is where sometimes we don't feel or we feel that the person giving us the feedback, um, we don't have necessarily trust there. We feel threatened by that person. The relationship isn't isn't good and strong, and so that affects the the way we engage in the in the in the feedback that they're giving us. And then the last one is around identity, where regardless of what the the, the actual content of the feedback, we feel um, threatened ashamed or off balance in some way so then that's regardless of the content and it, that's an important point there i think that sometimes the feedback nqt is received and i i saw all three of those kind of come through in the conversations um i would say the one that seemed the the kind of the strongest trigger in a way was the one around identity where perhaps um there was a lot the, the person, the NQT themselves brought a lot to, a lot of expectation, a lot of um, kind of internal pressure um, and emphasis to the, to the feedback conversation, which meant that actually feedback that was perceived as negative really triggered how they saw themselves. Um, and so that one was probably quite a strong one. And it, that links in with the idea of blind spots, because we, you know, we all have perception gaps. Um, every single one of us has perception gaps. And that can also be a barrier to engaging with feedback and to receiving feedback when we when it just doesn't feel we just don't recognize it because our perception of ourselves, our perception of what we're doing and the impact we have is is so far from the feedback we are receiving. Um, and it's almost like the, the gap is too big to close in that feedback. And there's two, two main types of, of perception gaps. There's the imposter syndrome, which we, in which we feel that we are not nearly as good as we actually are. We see all our gaps, we see all our failings, we see all our struggles, and we don't realise what we're actually doing and achieving. Um, and again, I saw that showing up. I saw that showing up in the sense that a number of NQTs would say, you know, my supporter tells me I need to be a bit kinder to myself or I need to not give myself such a hard time. Um, so that one was definitely coming through as well. Um, and then the Dunning-Kruger effect is where we, we think our skill set or our ability to deliver that skill set is higher than it actually is. And both of these perception gaps are problematic because wherever we're starting from is, is not the reality, I use the term uh, loosely because there's always perception involved in that. But if, if we've got good self-awareness and we're really clear on who we are, what we do and the impact that we have, then we can choose actions that help to move us forward that are coming from the right place. But if we don't, if we think we are not nearly as good as we are and we choose actions, then they're probably not going to move us forward because actually we, we've started from that kind of faulty place. And so a question I suppose that comes up for me is how do we open and how do we close perception gaps? Um, because telling someone doesn't necessarily work. Telling someone doesn't necessarily open up a perception gap because it triggers that identity thing or the truth thing where it's just like, no, I don't think that is the case at all. So we need to think about how do we open up those perception gaps and then how do we close them? And I did talk to, to a number of NQTs about potentially, um, I was gonna say interviewing themselves, videoing themselves um, because the use of video and I, there's lots of caveats around that and lots of things to consider and I'm not suggesting you do it but one thing the video does is it is it allows the person it allows the NQT who's normally the one being observed it allows them to step into the observer role as well and it allows them to see themselves because when we are teaching when we're doing anything we can't be both participant and observer as well and that's often where some of those perception gaps come from 
trust is really important. Um, feedback happens in relationships. Um, openness to feedback is generally connected with high levels of trust. So we are more likely to be open to feedback from those we trust, those that we have high personal and professional regard for. Um, and I guess one of the things that I observed and reflected on was that it's been difficult for NQTs to have the kind of relationships that they would normally have with, not necessarily with their supporter, although, although that is also the case in the sense that a lot of stuff is done um, online, um, done through video, and also, but also the connections with wider staff group as well. So not necessarily always having the opportunities to interact, to have conversations, to build trust um, and to seek advice and help and support as well, but also get different perspectives on their practice and what they're doing. And I, and I do I do think that that needs to be kind of acknowledged or recognised that, that the whole context in which they've come into has been different and that's had an impact as well. Um, and of course we can't control that impact, but it's just recognising that it, it has been there or it is, it is there and can have a potential impact. And of course all of the, all feedback requires us to be vulnerable. So whenever we are in a position where we are seeking feedback or being given feedback, we are vulnerable. And that vulnerability can lead us to act in, in different ways. Um, it can trigger different barriers or blocks to feedback, some of the ones that I've talked there, uh, talked about there. And I also then was reflecting on the work of Brené Brown, um, which I'm sure many of you will have heard of or will have read a book or listened to a podcast or even she has a Netflix special as well. Um, but in her book, uh, Dare to Lead, she has an engaged feedback checklist. Wait, and one of the things that, that kind of really resonated with me when I was reflecting on all of these parts of the puzzle and this whole experience was one of the, the things on her checklist is to sit on the same side of the table as the person you're giving feedback to. And there's something quite visual about that, you know, that image of sitting across the table from someone, that kind of almost like an interview type situation, and then the sitting on the same side and having a more equal or more balanced or yeah, just a just a different kind of conversation. But all but what that's about is helping people to overcome the impact of vulnerability and how, how we respond to feedback and how open we are to feedback. So it's an interesting checklist. Um, you can download it from her website and I should have had it available to put in the chat, my apologies, but um, it might be of interest to, to some of you to have a look at as well. And I guess that vulnerability taps into this idea of sensitivity that when it comes to feedback, we have different responses. Um, or different uh, dispositions perhaps and one of them might be around sensitivity and there are under and over sensitive reactions if you like and so and again I, I, I could see this coming through in some of the conversations was you know some of the NQTs were very sensitive to the feedback that they were receiving, receiving so much so that that was almost then becoming a barrier to them doing something with the feedback that they had received because their emotional response was kind of overwhelming their ability to then take action on it because they were supersizing it. You know, something that when we talked about it and they, they explored it in the context of a coaching conversation, something that didn't have as much power or as much emotion attached to it, um, they could see what they could do to move forward with that or they could see you know, a more balanced perspective on that feedback, but that tendency to be sensitive can lead to supersizing it and that becomes then another barrier to, to, um, to taking the feedback on board and to doing something with it. And, and that can also be that kind of really strong reaction, but it also can lead to blaming others. It can lead to that kind of um, 
I guess almost defensive um, response or yeah, looking for other reasons why that might be the case because we're so sensitive to it and it has such an impact on us. It taps into the whole identity bit again. And then the, the, those who were kind of under sensitive to feedback, you know, perhaps not really realizing feedback had been given. Um, and it, it's harder for me to say if I was seeing the under sensitive and it was hard for me to say if I was seeing the, the kind of the Dunning-Kruger effect because it, that's just a bit more nuanced to tap into and you require like a lot more connection and experience and dialogue with these people. But I think I was seeing elements of that sometimes, you know, was feedback given? Have I actually been told this? Forgetting to work on it or, or dismissing it and feeling like actually I know, I know what I'm doing, I've got this sorted. So it can be interesting just to reflect in the conversations you have and the people you're working with, you know, are they are they falling into either of those kind of dispositions and of course it's, it's a continuum and no one's exactly one thing or the other but sometimes having frameworks or some having something to to kind of reflect on and shape your thinking can help you to navigate a, work, a way through it and therefore think about how you adjust and respond what you do so if you know someone is an oversensitive type response to the feedback how do you adjust the conversation you have, not to change the feedback, but to reduce their sensitivity so that the feedback has a greater, a greater impact, if that makes sense. Um, and for many of the, the, the NQTs, cognitive overload or feelings of overwhelm was, was significant, just in a, very, in a very general sense. But interestingly, those things have both a conscious and an unconscious impact on our ability to engage with feedback. If you think about having a, a glass of water and it's three quarters full and you, you pour half a, a, another glass in, it starts to overflow and it's exactly the same with, with, our, with our brain, with our heads. So if, if they're already feeling overwhelmed and overloaded, receiving more feedback and more information about what they need to do or what their gaps are, can just tip everything over, but also then they lose the capacity to do much with that because they then are in that kind of state of overwhelm and overload. So it affects their ability to understand the feedback they're getting, but it also affects their ability to prioritise what they need to do. Um, and prioritisation, in addition to that sort of overwhelm, was definitely an issue that was coming through as well. Um, just that whole feeling of what what do you do when how do you how do you fit it all in and i i don't doubt for a second that's not new to the nqt year but maybe there was another layer or another layer of complexity to it that when they haven't when it's not a habit and they're still having to think about it all these things add up and then before you know it there's no capacity for anything else um and and a lot of them talking about really how they get to grips with the restrictions and the impact of the restrictions and what they can do and not do. And just all, all of that was taking up capacity um, as well. And one of the things that I shared with many of them is something called a Kanban, which is a way of managing your um, <clears throat> to-do list. It doesn't give you more time, but um, it can help you with prioritization and it can help you with kind of managing realistic expectations about what you can get done, what needs to be done, um, which comes back into the prioritization uh, again as well. Um, I won't go I won't go into that unless um, unless it's helpful to. Um, but if you if you Google Kanban, you'll see plenty of plenty of stuff on it. And again, I just offered it as a as a possibility as a suggestion, a way of reducing that overwhelm because it helps with the cognitive overload because you're not keeping the stuff in your head and it helps with the prioritization and that feeling of making progress, um, which was quite important to many of them as well. Um, and I always forget about the J curve, <laughs> which I, I've bypassed, but that's about thinking about where we are in the learning process. So we know that when when we start something new, it's quite exciting. We feel quite upbeat, but then there's always a dip that comes um, and there's lots of different ways of 
um, and lots of different researchers have talked about all the different dips that we experience, but we know that when we are learning something new, we will start with enthusiasm and excitement, and then we will experience a dip. And the reason I've included that here is that it can be helpful just to think about and recognise where in that J-curve are your NQTs at any moment in time, and therefore how does that influence perhaps the type of feedback that you give. So when they're in the bottom of that dip, maybe they need more of the appreciation and the coaching. Now, I know there's certain timescales and things um, that aren't negotiable, but ha again, having a framework and having something to think about can help us to tailor the kind of feedback that we give and to think about how would they, how we get the best possible um, conditions for them to engage with that feedback. And also knowing it can be helpful to share with, with NQTs, for example, because knowing that there is that curve and knowing where you are on it can help you to see that actually it does improve and you do get through that. And sometimes it can feel like you, you, you're not getting through it, you're stuck in the pit. Uh, <clears throat> and then lastly, I just want to talk about the, the, the arc of the conversation. And I guess I found this useful just to sort of pull together. So what, you know, what does it mean then when we're having a conversation? Um, and I think this came from the, the Thanks for the Feedback book as well, looking at the opening part of the conversation and we're getting really clear on the purpose of that feedback conversation, looking at the type of feedback that you're going to be giving or that the person likes to receive and, and setting expectations for the conversation as well. The body of the conversation then is about, it's about listening as well as giving information. It's also about kind of asserting information. So having a dialogue, um, thinking about how you move through the problem solving process. How do you actively both engage with the feedback? So feedback shouldn't be one directional. It should be that kind of interaction. Like, how do you make sense of it? Because if they haven't made sense of it by the time they leave the room or the virtual room, um, the chances of them being able to do anything with it are massively reduced. So how do we engage them in the feedback so that they, they own it, I guess? And then lastly, closing with really clear commitments. And again, that might be from both sides. What will, what will you do? What will they do? What are the really clear actions that they're going, to, they're going to do? And how are we going to follow up on these actions? And making sure that there is that feedback follow-up loop so that whatever actions are given are followed up on as well in terms of the discussion. So I hope that's been helpful just by way of um, I guess my my story, the story of my experience and how I've kind of made sense of it and what I what I experienced and and then also drawing on kind of research and writing that's out there around feedback and trying to make sense of a process that's really complex um, and potentially quite unique as well. So that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I'm just trying to find all the right buttons here. <laughs> um, so it would be, I, I just, that's the second time I've, I've heard you chat through that. And I think it's it's really fascinating. Um, I think Kirsty is going to manage us through some of the, the questions now. So please, if you've got any feedback that, that you'd like to share or questions or indeed suggestions um, as to what the next the next part of the support package might look like. We'd, we'd really welcome uh, your your comments and, and the questions. So, is there anything there so far, Kirsty? Just waiting for my button <laughs> for the the <laughs> camera to come on there, and the button's <laughs> decided to move on the other side of the control panel. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, just on the um, support available. Um, I just had somebody um, asking, sort of, Elaine, you, you mentioned at the start um, about help videos and the, the rubric, and it was just, they were just wondering where they might be able to find that. So I just wondered if you could sort of mention that. So, I've, yeah, I've picked up that question. So I don't have the technical skills to attach the rubric, but I've actually I've sent it to, to Kirsty in Teams chat, so she maybe will just to share that with you. 
Um, I'll need to just check out the, the links for the films. They, they were on the, the link was on the GTCS website. Um, I just want to make sure that those links are still live before before sharing them. So um, is there a way, Kirsty, that we can contact people again following today or? Yeah, I mentioned to the person um, who had said um, that they were looking for it. Um, and we'll, we'll have their email address. Um, but yeah, if anybody else is looking for it, then they can they can either um, put a message in the chat box just now, um, or I'll see if I can get it uploaded to the handout section just while you're answering some other questions. Thank you. Um, so someone else was also just asking Sarah if you could repeat the the website um, and the and the uh, author that you mentioned earlier on. Um, Leadership, leadership. <laughs> uh, Brené Brown. So B R E N E Brown. Um, I think her website is just brennybrown.com or something. Um, and if you go onto her website, she's got a kind of resources section. And if you click on that, you'll find the engaged checklist, engaged feedback checklist um, in there. And the book was called Dare to Lead. I think I see it there actually, just the first um, resource that you've mentioned that you've uh, annotated onto your um, sketch notes. So if people download that, they'll have a little note of, of um, the name of that book as well. Yeah. Um, someone is asking about, um, they thought the part on closing the perception gap was um, quite interesting and, and if there was any further advice on, on how to do this, um, they're concerned that their probationer is lacking self-awareness so they're keen to address this. Um, yeah, I don't think there's just one, one magic way <laughs> um, and I'm kind of cautious about, you know, suggesting things without knowing very much information but um, I think it you're right self-awareness is at the key um the key to opening up those perception gaps and that's why i often say to people you know if they consider videoing themselves then they can see themselves as somebody else would see them um whereas when you're in particularly teaching you can't you can't be both participant and observer and of course we do we have a tendency to do quite a lot of observation in education as well which is one possible way but you still have that difference of perception because as the observer you've seen x y and z but the participant was busy doing x y and z so their perception of that is still going to be very different so I think fundamentally it comes back to looking at that idea of self-awareness and what are all the possible ways that you can open up conversations around the kind of reality of what's happening um, and their experience of what's happening. So video is one way, observation is, is another. Where else can you get feedback about the impact that they're having? How, do you, how can you get into that conversation that begins to nudge at their self-awareness so it's not necessarily about just about showing them but also the questions that you can ask that begin to open up that possibility for for self-awareness um, but that's something maybe to for me to think about as well in terms of what might some of those questions be and see if there are you know some questions that i could share that might be useful to people you can i'll write that down <laughs> Um, just a note to say, I know a few people have asked for the rubric and I've managed to get it uploaded to the handout section on the control panel now. So if anybody's looking for a copy, they should be able to download it um, as a PDF from there. Um, but back to questions. So someone's asking um, if, they, if you have any tips on giving feedback remotely um, following an observation of an online lesson. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, I think I, oh, I think all the things that I've talked through are the foundations for for giving feedback. I don't I don't I don't think there's a significant difference in how you get the best feedback conversation, whether it's online or in person. But I would say that if the relationship has only ever been online, 
that's different to having had a relationship you know that's in the face-to-face -face world as well so i think that's the bit to maybe think about um i think thinking about what you want to get out of the, the conversation what do they want to get out of the conversation um again i've come back to that vulnerability thing of and i could make a, I, I suppose i'm making a sweeping um statement here that somebody might feel more vulnerable being observed teaching online than they might be in the classroom so how do we recognize that when we begin the conversation um something else that, that is worth considering you know in the future it's not for that particular conversation but also asking the person being observed what do they want to get from the observation because that can help to build um the relationship because then you come not necessarily as, as equals because there's still a difference in that relationship but if I've got some control over what I want to get out of the feedback conversation and what I would like feedback on then it helps to reduce some of my vulnerability and helps me to feel more open to the process um, as well I hope that helps Um, and we've got someone asking um, about um, building confidence. They've got a probationer who's incredibly lacking in it and, and they're finding it difficult to build this. Um, do you have any tips or suggestions as to how that they might be able to overcome this? Oh, it's one of life's great questions, isn't it? <laughs> um, I suppose that's tapping into the, the imposter syndrome. Um, and again, I would say giving really specific feedback. So, um, you know, we know this from all of Carol Dweck's work on, on mindset and the role of specific praise and feedback. Um, the more specific you can be, the more likely someone is to take that feedback on board. Um, I think it's worth considering what what is the thing that person fears or what is that the thing that person feels that they lack and can you explore that with them? Um, you can't necessarily give them confidence that you think they should have, but you can use your feedback to support to build their sense of self. Um, I guess I am not a, personally a big fan of confidence as a as a term and a thing. I tend to prefer an air towards more self-efficacy, which is around that real deep sense of self and who I am and what I what what I do what I bring um, and that efficacy comes from experiencing success so are they aware when they've experienced success and how can you help them to see that um, it comes from feedback as well and it also comes from that kind of psychological safety of being able to make mistakes and be okay when you've made a mistake because often that lack of efficacy comes from a fear of fear of failure, I suppose, fear of getting things wrong. Um, so maybe a few things to think about there. Um, we've got lots of great questions and do have um, a little bit of time. Um, some really interesting ones. So hopefully <laughs> Sarah is able to tackle all of these. Um, so just thank you um, for everyone who's sort of asking questions right now. Um, someone's asked how do you suggest supporting how do you suggest approaching a supporter regarding their feedback if you are the regent i've had cases when the supporter has set too high expectations for the probationer to meet do you want to say anything about that elaine i've actually had a situation like that that's what's just making me sort of reflect on that and what what we did in that situation was take it back to the starting point if you like of probation so the look having a look at the spr so i suppose using the rubric um and then looking at what hopefully the end point of probation maybe is is meeting the sfr and looking at the pathway between the two and and i suppose get helping the supporter to recognize that everybody progresses at their own rate that there's no it's not set in stone um and that you know whatever pathway they're choosing to get there it is okay um but just that reminder that when when probationers are starting um their probation they're they're, they're at the spr that they're, they're not at the sfr so it's all about the progress towards it and perhaps 
breaking it down kind of into chunks as to what steps might be towards meeting the SFR. I find that quite an effective way um, to manage that. Great, thank you. Um, another question, um, the discussion around changing our feedback when we may observe that probationers are sensitive to feedback. Um, this person's just wondering um, if there are any other um, resources that, that might be out there um, and how do you deliver the feedback in the appreciation form rather than a coaching style? Um, so there's a few parts to to that. Just to just to clarify, because I'm not sure if this is what the what the question was or what it reflected. When I was saying about recognising the sensitivity, wasn't necessarily um, certainly wasn't rather <laughs> your feedback would be different as a result of that. The feedback is the feedback, but it's how we engage in that conversation that might be different. So just to just for clarity on that, because I don't want you to think that you know if someone's really sensitive to feedback, you just be really nice to them, uh, but the feedback is still the feedback, and and um, there's a there's a kindness also I think to recognise in giving really clear feedback. You know, one of the worst things that we can do is pretend like things are okay or try to make things better than they actually are, because that just creates a much bigger issue or upset, you know, further down down the line. So. I would say clarity is absolutely key in any of the feedback experiences we have, but we might think about the almost like the, I talked at the end, you know, the arc of the conversation, thinking about how you scaffold the conversation of feedback so that someone who's quite sensitive feels safe or feels less vulnerable or thinking about how you hold the space for that emotional reaction and then help them through the other side of it as well you know and I, it's difficult because with all of these situations there's no one one way to to do it and each of the NQTs that you're going to be engaging with is is unique and different and I suppose what I've done is take each of those unique experiences and drawn out something that is that can help us to think about the bigger picture but doesn't necessarily tell you as one supporter how to manage feedback with one NQT. Um, in terms of any other resources around feedback, I will have a think. Nothing's coming, um, nothing's springing straight to mind at the moment, but let me have a think and I'll come back if there is. And there was another part to that question, which was about appreciation. Is that right? Sorry. I've lost the question. <laughs> I think it was something yeah. about how do you give, a, how do you do the appreciation bit? Um, it's about gr like gratitude and, and thanks. Um, and this is a thing that's coming up for me a lot at the moment in lots of different conversations I'm having, that sometimes there can be a lack of that appreciation um, for, for what we do and just, it's those small things. And, and it, appreciation links quite, in, quite nicely with trust. So trust is built in the small moments, not the big moments. Um, but when it comes to a big moment, that's when we draw on the trust that we have built up. So it's the, it's the simple things. It's the things like, you know, acknowledging when you see someone do something, it's checking in on them, it's making an effort to, um, you know, notice something that they did or that their class did. It's those little things, but actually they are significant in the messages that, that gives to that person about who they are within the context of the school and the school community and being a part of it, which comes back to the very beginning bit about they just want to be accepted and respected within that community. And so appreciation is about saying thank you, but it's also about that kind of acknowledgement and noticing that they're there, you know, in a very basic way, if you like. But what that does is it helps to build trust. And the more trust there is, the more open we are to to feedback as well. So that appreciation will really help when there's more tricky feedback conversations to take place. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, I've got a, another uh, interesting question here. Um, 
Is someone asking, um, how do you address a probationer who is perceived to be doing too much? So they're working beyond their hours um, and there's a lack of personal and work boundary. <laughs> do you want to stab at that one, Elaine? <laughs> I think that's quite a common one, isn't it? I think it continues throughout careers as well. Um, I think the message that, that we've always tried to share with probationers is that to be that interesting, um, real teacher in a classroom, you, you have to see that the things you do outside school as being just as important as the things that you do in school. You know, I used to, I used to really like it as a teacher when pupils and maybe this was part of you know why I think I had quite good relationships with them was they were they were interested in me as, as much as I was interested in them about what, what they've been doing. So you know on a Monday they wanted to know what I'd been up to the weekend and it wasn't me about coming in and actually telling them everything I'd done. It was just you know they wanted to know if you'd been skating or if you'd been out for you know a walk with a dog and the dog had covered you with mud. It was just that kind of thing. The biggest insult to me I think was if you know if 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 the People's, the children had turned around and sort of laughed is because they thought I lived in the school. You know, that would just be, uh, be awful to me. Um, so there's a sense of giving probationers, I think, permission that actually to be that whole sort of rounder person, they, they need to be out there doing other things and, and, and having a life. Um, and we used to, and I appreciate that's more difficult in, in the context we're now living in. Um, but something that we used to, absolutely actively promote was about you know I, I, I get it about being really committed and, and having one year to get to do probation and, and really trying to, to do your very best but give yourself one night off during the week and you know really plan to do whatever you want whether it's sitting down and watching a box set whether it's sitting down and having a glass of wine whether it's going to the cinema you know meeting friends whatever normally it, it would be going out for a bike ride, anything just to get away from that kind of routine of every night I go home and I work on I work on school stuff. Um, and it would just give that, that break at some point during the week. And also the other key thing for me was about not spending all weekend um, work, working. And if, you know, I think sometimes it's very, very difficult to convince a probationer that, that they aren't working at the weekend. So if they're insisting, it's then about them identifying a block of time when they will work at the weekend, but the rest, they need to be with family, spend time with family, because it's not just about them. There's other people in their life or other animals in their lives or you know whatever that, that they will greatly benefit from spending time with. So I think it's a it's an important thing just about giving them permission almost to, to do that. That that would be my advice. I don't know if Sarah's got anything to, to add to that. Um, it would be very similar, to be honest, and that, that is a lot of the conversations that, that I did have where that, that came up. I also, the, the other bit I did talk about was, um, was about creating habits and actually being mindful that what you do this year could potentially create a habit that you will find very hard not to do in the coming years. And because, and the reason I talked about that was because Sometimes there was a thing coming through that this was, well, I'll just need to do that this year to get through this year and then it'll be different next year. And actually, you know, some things will be different next year for sure. But if you've created a habit that tells you in your head, I can only teach this way if I work all the hours I have, then that's going to be really difficult to come back from. And and I think for a few where I had that conversation, there was it was almost like there was a little bit of a click there. Of, oh yeah, this this isn't actually just about this year. This is, you know, all the years to come. And and we know that if if you do that for a year, you've you've built a habit, and it's going to be really hard to get out of the habit. Um, and I think recognizing that in the situation we're in at the moment, there's there's a temptation to maybe do more because you can't do anything else as well so i think there's a you know and if you already have a tendency to do that it's it's like um everything's intensified because of the restrictions and lockdown as well so i definitely saw that coming through as a as a bit of a factor 
Thank you. Um, I've got a question here that I'm not sure if we know the answer to, but um, this person saying that, that their probation is really struggling with the fact that they don't, um, they've not been having those classroom experiences. Um, and how do you, how do you sort of work through that? The fact that um, obviously there just isn't the possibility to be in a in a proper classroom um, this year. I think they need to look at the longer term. That so this, this year is their probation, but you know things that they've not had the opportunity to engage in this year, they will have in future years. So the I suppose to flip it and trying to look at this year as a positive, there are areas that they can develop this year and, and you know develop skills around how they engage remotely, and um, how they use you know digital resources that could be a real advantage if, if they gain expertise in that this year and then you know in future years there will be plenty of time ahead of them to get to get the experience in the classroom. I think that's what I would I would say. And using the spheres of influence or circus, circles of control or whatever you want to want to call them, but thinking about what within this situation can we control? So as a probationer, what can they control? What can they influence? And what can they not control? And therefore, we kind of need to just let go of. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy to do that, but actually sometimes going through the process of physically writing it out, laying it out, in, and having that supported conversation for that can be really useful as, as well. Um, I think we've got time just for one more question. Um, th there are a few others, um, and I'll hopefully be able to, to get some answers from Elena and Sarah, that, and we can share them um, either via one-to-one -one email or um, just in the description of the, the webinar um, uh, recording. So if someone's asking, um, how do you get a probationer to engage in coaching sessions? They say that their probationer um, just nods and says yes, and they, the, the supporter is finding it difficult to sort of extract ideas and, and opinions from them. Dina, you're probably the expert in that one. <laughs> um, I think this is where I feel slightly conflicted, I suppose, in a way, because I guess at, at the heart of coaching is wanting to do the coaching. And and so also, if, if you've got someone who doesn't necessarily want to be coached, how do you have a coaching type conversation uh, with them? Um, I guess maybe I would explore what they want from the conversation. Like what a question I asked a lot of NQTs was how do you how do you learn best? Because that gives us insight into how we can help them to move forward. And I am a big fan of coaching, <laughs> so it's not it's not a criticism of coaching, but maybe it's just not the right way for that person. Maybe it's not the right time for coaching for that person. Um, and so I think sometimes we need to, you know, it, it would be my default, but actually if it's not working and they're not engaging in it, why might that be? What might suit them better? What would they prefer? What do they need? And having that kind of conversation, I, I use naming a lot, you know, naming, you know, what's happening. So, you know, that can sometimes create an awareness and a shift in a conversation that just keeping on trying to do it doesn't necessarily um, doesn't necessarily achieve. Thanks, Sarah. Um, like I say, we've got a, a few more questions, um, but I, I don't want. I know that people have other things to to go and do now, and I, I don't like to keep people on too long. So, um, I'll just say thank you to both Sarah and Elaine for. Um, this webinar this evening um, and thank you to everyone for attending and asking questions. Um, as I said, a recording will be available um, hopefully by the end of this week on our YouTube channel um, and you should be able to find that quite easily via um, just the search bar in YouTube. Um, and that's where all of our other recordings are as well. So you should be able to find um, other resources there. Um, and if you have any feedback, there's a, a short survey will pop up after this uh, webinar is over um, and you can also um, contact us at communications at gtcs.org.uk for any other webinar feedback. Um, so unless Sarah or Elaine have anything else to say, um, 
I will wish everyone a lovely evening and thank you again to everyone for attending. Thanks everyone. Bye.